It's so good to, to gather this morning together to worship King Jesus. Uh, I'm Robbie. I serve as one of the pastors here, and I have the great privilege of introducing our guest speaker for this morning, Jonathan Mosley. Jonathan, you can go ahead and make your way up here. Uh, Jonathan is a household name at Watkinsville. Uh, He's a church planner and pastor at Kings Hill Church in Boston, Massachusetts, and God led him about 11 years ago to go and start a new work up there in Boston, and, and uh, Jonathan's mel- uh, married to Chelsea, has be- four beautiful girls, and uh, he's taking the time to come down, pray for them. They're a little bit sick under the weather. Jonathan's fighting something, so pray for him as he speaks this morning, but brother, we look forward to br- you bringing the word this morning, what you have for us. Thank you, Thanks Robbie. for being here with us. Yeah, thank yeah. you. Love you. Love you too, man. Yeah. Oh, it's, uh, it is great to be with you guys. Uh, I always kind of a joy when I can come worship with the Watkinsville family. Uh, Watkinsville is the place where I discerned a calling into vocational ministry. I remember as a college student typing an email out to Pastor Carlos, didn't think he would respond, but he did, and he met me at a local coffee house and handed me this book titled, Am I Called? And from there, invited me to these early Friday morning prayer times and just invested in me, so I'm really grateful for Pastor Carlos and the staff. And, and up in Boston, Watkinsville, it's funny that Pastor Robbie mentioned a household name here, because you are definitely a household name up in Boston. It is, I've, I've lost track of how many youth and college students and families that have been sent up to Boston. And in many ways, we are kindred churches, not, not just in spirit, but in mission. We, uh, we recently added the word wholehearted to our mission statement, guiding generations to wholeheartedly follow God with a bold faith. And that word wholehearted was largely influenced by Watkinsville and the impact it's had on me. So it is a joy, a sincere joy to be here this morning. And that's what I'd like to share about actually this morning is the wholehearted mindset. The wholehearted mindset. If we were to define wholehearted, I'm not sure how... Pastor Carlos has defined it in the past, so hopefully I'm not contradicting him. I don't think so, but we would say a total devotion, a singular passion, no split allegiances, no competing rivalries, no rivaling affections. It's singular. It's fixed. There's nothing getting in the way of this wholeheartedness. And that's what we're going to see actually in this story today in Mark 14. So I want to invite you to turn there with me. To Mark chapter 14. We're going to read verses 1 through 11 together. And as you turn there, it's, it's worth stepping back to mention that the first 10 chapters of Mark cover about three years of Jesus' ministry. And the last six now, they, they zone in, and hone in, I guess would be the word, over the last week of Jesus' life. So Mark, first 10 chapters, pretty fast. The last six, he slows way down, and each event is significant, like the one we're about to see. So we're going to examine this story by looking at three things. First, the woman's offering. You might be familiar with it. Secondly, the disciples' reaction to this offering that the woman gives. And finally, I want to draw out some applications for us in this story, which is when we'll get to the wholehearted mindset. So with that in mind, let's look at now Mark 14, verses 1 through 11. It says, now the Passover and the festival of the unleavened bread were only two days away. And the chief priests and the teachers of the law were scheming to arrest Jesus secretly and to kill him. But not during the festival, they said, or the people might riot. Uh, riot. While, while he was in Bethany, reclining at the table in the home of Simon the leper, a woman came with an alabaster jar of very expensive perfume made of pure nard. And she broke the jar and poured the uh, perfume on his head. And some of those present were saying indignantly to to one another, why this waste of perfume? It could have been sold for more than a year's wages and the money given to the poor. And they rebuked her harshly. And Jesus said, leave her alone. Why are you bothering her? She has done a beautiful thing to me. The poor you will always have with you, and you can help them anytime you want, but you will not always have me. She did what she could. She poured perfume on my body beforehand to prepare me for my burial. Truly, I tell you, Wherever the gospel is preached throughout the world, what she has done will also be told in memory of her. Then Judas Iscariot, one of the twelve, went to the chief priest to betray Jesus to them. And they were delighted to hear this and promised to give him money. So he watched for an opportunity to hand him over. So I want us to consider the scene in these verses. 
Mark notes that this occurrence is happening during the time of Passover. This was an annual Jewish feast that included the slaughter of the Passover lamb. And it, and it foreshadowed Jesus, the lamb of God who would take away the sins of the, the world, whose death is now imminent. And it's no coincidence that God timed the death of his son during the feast of Passover. Now pay attention to verse 3 because enters this, enters this woman while Jesus is reclining with some guests at the home of Simon the leper. And she's unnamed here. She's, she's named in other accounts. But I think the reason that Mark doesn't name her here is because she, he wants to draw attention not to the woman's identity but the woman's act of faith. I think we have much to learn from this unnamed woman this morning. I want us to look once more at what she does in verse 3. It says, while he was in Bethany, reclining at the table in the home of Simon the leper, a woman came with an alabaster jar of very expensive perfume made of pure nard, and she broke the jar. She broke the jar and poured the perfume on his head. So here comes this woman. She brings in this flask. It's very expensive, very costly, and we're told that this, this flask was filled with pure Nard. It could have been sold for 300 denarii, which is a year's worth of wages. And those around her think she is totally reckless. They think she's absolutely foolish. In fact, Mark goes so far to say that she gets scolded, rebuked for what she did. This could have been given to the poor, those witnessing this act said. In fact, they, they said this. They said, this is wasted. This is wasted. That's what they say. But listen to what Jesus says in verses 6 through 8. It says, leave her alone. Why are you bothering her? She's done a beautiful thing to me. The poor you'll always have with you. You can help them anytime you want, but you'll not always have me. She did what she could. She poured this perfume on my body beforehand to prepare me for burial. So Jesus comes to this woman's defense, rebuke those who have, have responded with resentment, and they're thinking to themselves, come on, what are you doing here? Like, this could have been given to the poor. Like, you... You could have sold it and made a profit for yourself, but if anything, you could have given it to charity. Like, why would you just break this flask and pour it over Jesus' body? There's lots of ways you could have used this, but this isn't one of them. And so Jesus, paraphrasing in verse 2, says, basically, you all have underestimated my worth. You all have underestimated my worth. He says, the poor you'll always have with me. You can help them anytime you want, but you're not always going to have me. Now, is Jesus putting down the poor here? No, he's not doing that. The Old Testament is filled with instructions to care for, show mercy to, provide for the poor. But, get this, the greatest commandment is not love your neighbor as yourself. There's one that comes before it, which is love the Lord your God with all your heart, soul, mind, and strength. Now, those two are inseparable. We cannot, we cannot love God and ignore his image bearers. But this woman sees Jesus not just as a neighbor. She's, she sees Jesus as something more than just a man. Yes, a man, but more than that. She sees him as God himself. And so she recognized his worth, and so she offers him her very best, this alabaster flask. And here's what the disciples and Simon both miss, that the value of the gift should correspond to the honor of the guest. The value of the gift should correspond to the honor of the guest. And in this woman's eyes, Jesus is the treasure. We call Jesus the Lord of Lords. We call Jesus the King of Kings. But saving faith would go even further. Saving faith would say Jesus is the treasure of all treasures. Jesus is the prize of all prizes. And that's how this woman considers Jesus. And so she gives him all she has. And here's the big difference between the disciples and this woman. The, the disciples, they look at the flask, and they see it broken. They see the pure nard coming out of it. They look at the flask, and they say, that's wasted. And the woman is looking at Jesus. And she says, he's worthy. So that's the difference between the disciples now and this woman. And it's true that we are wholehearted about what we find most worthy. If someone values their career, their job as their highest aim in life, well, because of that, they hope for this influence or respect, then what's gonna happen is they will make whatever sacrifice they need to to climb the ladder of their profession. If that's what they find most worthy, they'll make the sacrifices ne necessary. If someone values money higher than their relationship with God, then they're gonna sacrifice the virtue of generosity 
and the obedience of faithful stewardship to keep the money. Because what you find most worthy is what you're wholehearted about. It's what you're not willing to compromise on. It's what you want to keep more than anything else. And for this woman, what she wants is Christ. She wants to please Jesus, bless Jesus, minister to Jesus. And because he's at the top of what her heart most values, of what her heart finds most worthy, she doesn't care what she loses if it means she can have him. And so that's the woman's offering. But there are a couple of other parties here mentioned besides the woman. So I want us to take a look at them. In, in, in classic Markan style, this woman is sandwiched between the Pharisees in Mark 11, 1 through 2, and then Judas in verses 10 and 11. He does this a lot throughout the book. And so now let's take a look at how the disciples respond. If the woman shows what wholeheartedness looks like, Towards God, what you see in the scribes, what you see with Judas, is a heart that ultimately loves the world more than God. The scribes want to kill him. Judas, Judas wants to betray him, and they're they're actually both rooted in the same reason. So let's look at those. We, we aren't told explicitly what those are in this passage, but we are told in other gospel accounts. So, so consider now, consider the first party that that's mentioned in Mark, the scribes, the Pharisees. And here's what's in the heart of the Pharisees in, in Luke chapter 16, verses 13 and 14. Here's what it says. It says, Jesus speaking here, no one can serve two masters. Either you will hate the one and love the other, or you will be devoted, devoted, wholehearted to the one and despise the other. You cannot serve both God and money. The Pharisees who loved money heard all of this and were sneering at Jesus. So money or God, you can't be devoted to both. You can't be wholehearted about both. Only one gets your whole heart. So the Pharisees hear what Jesus has to say about money, and their reaction is they slander him and they mock him. Or consider the words of Matthew, verses 23, uh, sorry, verse 25 in chapter 23, again addressing the Pharisees. Jesus says, woe to you, teachers of the law and of the Pharisees, you hypocrites. You clean the outside of the cup and the dish, but inside you're full of greed and self-indulgence. So, so Jesus, on more than one occasion, shows, exposes the heart of the Pharisees. Their hearts are full of the love of money. Their hearts are greedy. They want more, more, more. That's what their hearts are saying. So the reason why the Pharisees hate Jesus so much, of course, on one hand, yes, he's claiming to be God's son. He's claiming to be deity. They, they, they count that as blasphemous. But he's also exposing a wrong and misplaced love of their hearts. So we've considered... The Pharisees now consider Judas, Judas. I mean, he became the, the poster child to where the love of money leads. Throughout Jesus' ministry, you have Judas, who's the treasurer. He keeps the money bags. And get this, as we turn to the gospel of John in chapter 12, we actually learn more details of this account in Mark 14. So let me read that for you. Same account being mentioned here. But one of his disciples, Judas Iscariot, who, had, who was later to betray Jesus, objected... Why wasn't this perfume sold and the money given to the poor? It was worth a year's wages. So now we're, we're led into what's in his heart. He did not say this because he cared about the poor, but because he was a thief. And as a keeper of the money bag, he used it to help himself to what was put into it. So, so the Gospel of, of John helps us understand what's in the heart of Judas in Mark 14. I mean, Judas is speaking on one side of his mouth, hey, this, this should have been given to the poor, as if he cares about charity. Meanwhile, what's happening inside of him is he wants, he wants that money for himself. He was someone that was driven by money, which ultimately led to Jesus' betrayal. Judas sold him out. And I, I want us to understand now the contrast between the scribes, verses 1 and 2, Judas, verses 11 and 12, or 10 and 11, and, and now in the middle here, this woman who offers up the alabaster flask. Because the scribes and, the, and Judas, they, they, sell out, they sell out Jesus for their selfish gain, that they did not count Jesus as their treasure. They counted the world as their treasure. And Jesus, he's already said, you can only be sold out for one thing. And, and when we're about seeking for us to gain stuff, for us to gain stuff, for us to gain the world, when, when our hope is fixed on reputation gain or financial gain or relation gain, when it's self at the center, then we're stepping into the very shoes of Judas. When it's all about us and our kingdom 
in our world. But Mark is showing us that this woman doesn't sell out Jesus for her gain, but is sold out for Jesus because at the end of the day, her hope is in Christ. Gain is having more of him. And so this woman had found her treasure and she gave up everything for him. It makes me think of the parable that Jesus told about the kingdom of heaven. The kingdom of heaven is like a treasure hidden in a field. When a man found it, he hid it again and then in his joy, he sold all that he had and he bought that field. Now, what I want for us, what I want for me, what I want for my family, is I want us to resemble the bold faith that's in this woman. What I don't want for us is to be Judas. He's with Jesus, but he has one foot in and one foot out. He's, you know, he's traveling from town to town. He's doing the things Jesus has told him to do. He's even, even ministering in Jesus' name, and yet his heart is not like Christ. And so how does one become a Judas? That's the question I'm asking me. Like, how does one become like that? Well, you become like that when you, when you look at your career or when you look at your ambitions and you say, oh, that's worthy. And you, you sell out God because you're so focused on those goals, those plans that oftentimes maybe God hasn't even put in your heart and you trade him for them because you said that's worthy. Or you look at relationships that you know aren't healthy or right or God-honoring, and you say, that's worthy. And you sacrifice the relationship that God wants with you for him or her. Or you start to be drawn to the American dream, the, the, the nice house, the, the great 401k. Not that those things are bad, but slowly and surely... Comfort, the love of comfort takes home in your heart. And you look at the attractiveness of ease and luxury and you say, oh man, that's worthy. And you trade in that for this intentional, missional calling that God's placed on every Christian. See, what you're wholehearted about is what you find most worthy. And if we choose the world, because that's the test. If we choose the world over God, and after this very short life is over, and we give an account for our lives, it will not be what's coming out of the disciples' mouth, but over from God's mouth, and he'll say, wasted. That's a life wasted. And so I'm here today just to stir up my own heart as I'm, as I'm preaching, but maybe even your heart too that might need it, that by way of reminder that the infinite riches of God's grace is expressed in the person of Christ. He alone offers forgiveness of sins. He alone has victory over sin, Satan, and death. He alone gives us the promise of eternal life and happiness in his presence. He's the only one that gives us eternal purpose. Who the Father said, if we come to know Jesus, he lavishes his love on us. To him, to him alone, can our hearts cry out, worthy, worthy. He alone has that title. The angels now crying out, holy, holy, holy is the Lord God Almighty. There's not a thing on earth or a person on earth that can outdo the worth of Christ. Now, I told you that we would look at this woman's offering, which we did, the reaction of the disciples, which we did. But now I just want to provide some application. What does the wholehearted mindset look like? This is my prayer for me, for my family, that we would be wholehearted about Christ. And I think as we think about the wholehearted mindset, it's worth pondering the actions of this woman. There's three mindsets that maybe we can lean into together as a church. First... And I'll share these briefly. First, the, the wholehearted mindset says, Jesus, I value your approval over people's approval. You were worth more to me than the thoughts of others. So that's wholehearted mindset number one. When this woman walks into the dinner party, she is breaking cultural taboos. Like this, in this time, in this place, this is not where a woman should be. We're not even sure she was invited to the party for crying out loud. And even if she was, she's late because everyone else is talking, eating, reclining, doing their thing. And apparently she's interrupting this gathering because she's not welcomed. 
And her gesture, actually, Mark mentions that it causes indignation. Literally, meaning the, 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 the uh, word image there is a horse flaming his nostrils. So the disciples are heated, upset, mad about this woman coming into the room. And in their eyes, she is absolutely foolish. I just want to pause here because maybe this resonates with you. But as we surrender our lives to Jesus, like, I'm not saying somewhat surrender, but when we totally surrender our lives to Jesus, very likely your approval rating will plummet. Because nominal Christians are not going to understand you, culture is going to hate you, you're going to be called dumb, crazy, and that's just at best. It escalates from there, and you'll likely lose out on promotions, friendships, experiences, pleasures, praise. I mean, people in Boston do, they, they lose their jobs over this. If they put their faith forward. And I'm reminded of what Paul says in Galatians chapter 1 verse 10. Am I trying to please, excuse me, am I trying to win the approval of human beings or of God? Am I trying to please people? If I were trying to please people, I would not, could not be a servant of Christ. And we shouldn't be naive to the cost of following Jesus. For many, their allegiance to Jesus means they will lose their family, some even their lives. And the question is, is he worth it? And for the woman, he was. And here's her mindset. She does not care what the disciples think about her. She does not care if the disciples call her stupid or ignorant or foolish. She doesn't care that they're angry. All she cares about is, Jesus, what do you think? Jesus, what do you think? And Jesus tells us what he thinks in verse 6. Leave her alone, said Jesus. Why are you bothering her? She has done a beautiful thing for me. You see, when you live for the beautiful from Jesus' mouth, you can face opposition with boldness. You don't live for people's approval. All that matters is what Jesus thinks. So that's wholehearted mindset, number one. Second, the wholehearted mindset says, I, Jesus, I value you over my possessions. Your purposes are more important to me than my comfort. Look with me at verses 8 and 9. It says, she did what she could. She poured perfume on my body beforehand to prepare for my burial. Truly, I tell you, wherever the gospel is preached throughout the world, what she has done will also be told in memory of her. It's interesting because... This woman, get this, was uniquely set up in this moment to anoint Jesus. She alone had the means necessary to provide this very specific contribution. Jesus had already predicted his death in previous chapters. And here she is, the one woman who has the ability to anoint his body for his future burial. And get this, she doesn't withhold it. She has the means, she has the opportunity, she has her moment. And she doesn't retreat from it. She doesn't walk back from it. She leans, in, leans into it. The anointing that Jesus was going to have was going to be provided by what she had. <laughs> and I, I'm, I'm, I'm asking my question, like, what would I have done? You know, like a, a whole year's worth of wages? Like, would I just take that out of my savings account and just throw that somewhere for some gospel impact? Like, that, that takes some faith. I'd like to say I would do that, but like as I'm reading this, my like, Lord, help my heart do that. Because I'm not sure sometimes. In fact, I think a lot of us, maybe we don't like, we're not going to vocalize this, but some of us, and, and I mean, if, if I'm preaching to anyone here, I'm preaching to Jonathan Mosley, right? Some of us have this imaginary line in our lives. Like we wouldn't say that, but it's a line that says, Jesus, I will follow you to this point. But please don't ask me to cross that line. Please don't ask me to go any further. Like this, it's a little inconvenient. It's going to cost me a little comfort. But this right here, whoa, like that's way too much for me. Like don't ask me to go that far. Like that, this is like cross territory here. Got to pick it up there. And many of us live with that. But not the woman. Not the woman. Everything at her disposal, she offers up to Jesus. I mean, if you think about it, is there a better way to spend your resources 
even a year's worth of wages for the anointing of Jesus' body? The answer is no. Like the best way that we can spend our sweat, that we can spend our schedule, our savings, our speech, is for worship of our king, to see the kingdom of God move forward. Ultimately, there is no better way to invest your time, talent, and treasure than when it's going to the worship of God. So to get to the point where you can do that, you have to hold in your heart that the purposes of God, the purposes of God are more important than our pleasures and comforts. And so I, I hope maybe we can say that with conviction this morning. God, all I have is yours. There is no place in my heart that I hide. There is no resource that you've given me that I hoard. There is no plan for my life that I hold. Everything is on the table. Everything is yours. If you want it, you got it. That's the heart of this woman. And third and finally, the wholehearted mindset says this. It says, Jesus, I value you over every earthly thing. And I look to you to fulfill everything my heart desires. Question, how do you get to the place in your life where you can take a year's worth of savings and just say, Jesus, it's yours? (laughs) I mean, how do you get to that place? How how do you get to the place where the Lord has your entire heart so that it, it overflows into giving above and beyond what you could actually do? Like what kind of trust would it take? What kind of experience with Jesus would you need to have to understand, to take it from head to heart, to truly understand that he is better than anything else on earth? Where the world loses its taste, its its sway, its influence. I think this woman experienced it. Now, until until this moment, I haven't given you the name of the woman. It's not actually given in Mark. But it is given in other accounts. And her name is Mary. Mary of Bethany. She had two siblings that we know of. Martha and Lazarus. And Mary had a recent experience with Jesus that was unforgettable. You might remember the story in John 11. Lazarus dies. And then (laughs) he's brought back to life. Like, like. That's what happens. And so when you meet someone who has the power to raise your dead brother back to life, when you meet someone who has the power to forgive your sins, when you meet someone who has the power to defeat death, then I guarantee you're not following the money. You're not following the world. Jesus, he's the one who's worthy. I'm following you. No thing or no one else has the power to do those things. And so why would she, why would she give up a year's worth of wages? Why would she break that alabaster flask? Why would she pour it out over Jesus' body? Why would she not hang on to her security, her resources? I mean, if Jesus raised my brother back to life, he's going to take care of me. I put my entire life in his hands. That's what the wholehearted mindset says. Psalm 73, verses 25 and 26. Who am I in heaven but you? There is nothing on earth that I desire besides you. My flesh and my heart may fail, but God, you're the strength and my portion forever. The wholehearted mindset says, Jesus, you are not, you are not simply a part of my life. That's not what the wholehearted mindset says. The wholehearted mindset does not say, Jesus, you're an important part of my life. That's not what the wholehearted mindset says either. The wholehearted mindset says, Jesus, you are my life. You're everything. You're all that I want. And you can give all the treasures in the world, but you are worthier than that. And so you have my entire heart. It says, I want nothing more than to experience more of you. And you can do whatever you want, and you can have whatever you want, and you can use me however you want so that others can know you too. That's what the wholehearted mindset says. And I pray that for myself, and I pray that for us. Let's pray together now. Father, thank you for this example that we see with this woman, with Mary, who breaks the alabaster flask. 
there's truly nothing that she holds back. She offers it all to you. God, I pray that would be true of our lives, that you would be magnified on the altar of our lives, to be all for you. Whatever imaginary line that we have with you, that we would erase it. That this morning, afresh, anew, we would be gripped by the fact that you rose from the dead and you give us hope where we will overcome death too. Our sins are washed away. Heaven is our home and our future. And we can live now on earth, not making it our home, but living with heaven in mind. And using however many days, however many weeks, however many years in such a way to point others to that hope too. Help us to be wholehearted for your kingdom. And I pray this in Jesus' name.